Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the breakout session for Emerging Technologies and Automation. Uh, we're talking today with a few folks that are going to talk to us about production automation uh, in a manufacturing environment. So uh, I am Janine Lasseline Berglund. Again, I'm the president of Automate Canada, who is one of the sponsors of this session as well as the conference today. I'm also the president of the Canadian Association of Mold Makers. I am going to introduce you to our guest speakers today. So I'm going to bring them on screen so that you can see their faces and get a little bit more familiar with them. So first up, we will have two sessions today or two guest speakers today talking a little bit about what's happening in their particular area. We're going to save our questions until the end of the presentations themselves. And you'll notice again in the side of your screen, there's an area for chatting as well as for Q&As. And if you could place your questions there, I'll be able to grab them as we moderate the question and answer period after we've concluded the presentations. So without further ado, let me first introduce Chris Lachane. Chris is from Valiant Machine. He's the application engineer manager of Valiant Machine and Tool. Uh, with 20 years of industry experience, Chris leads a team of application and R&D engineers focused on developing processes and technologies for the rapidly growing automotive EV manufacturing market and integrating industry 4.0 solutions to help make machines smarter. So welcome, Chris. Thank you, Janine. Thank, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, next up, we also have Alan Ali from Data Realm Incorporated. Alan loves to learn and is a creative problem solver with years of experience developing and integrating solutions for industrial manufacturing data and reporting systems. If something makes data that could be used to drive efficiencies, then Alan will find a way to collect it and report it. He's currently leading a team investigating and developing solutions for augmented and mixed reality in manufacturing. He's always excited to find new Lego bricks to use in his problem solving. So without further ado, welcome, Alan. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Well, absolutely. So what we're going to do is we're going to have Alan just leave the chat for a second, and we're going to have Chris go ahead and take over here and walk us through his presentation. Over All to you, right. Chris. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thanks to the event of organizers for inviting uh, us to speak this morning. Um, I'm just going to start sharing here. Let's get into the presentation. All right. Is everything looking OK? All right. So this morning, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the solutions that Valiant has for e-mobility and specifically talking about automation assembly systems with for manufacturing. So I think most people are aware of, of Valiant TMS, um, but we're a Windsor-based company. You know, we design, build, integrate intelligent automation solutions that leverage new technologies to create smart and sustainable factories for the world's leading companies. But, so what that really means is we're constantly looking at new technologies and how we can integrate them into existing processes and look forward into new processes for the future. Um, so, so getting into the, the EV side of manufacturing, you know, the EV side is presenting a whole bunch of new challenges for different automation solutions and production solutions for a number of various reasons, which we'll, we'll discuss, um, it, that are in contrast to the traditional methods used for a lot of the, uh, the legacy automotive components. Um, but specifically what we're talking about when we talk about e-mobility and, and EVs, um, it kind of get, breaks down into three categories. You have the electronics, those are the battery charging systems and inverter modules. You have the actual battery pack containing all the lithium ion cells, and then you have the electric, the actual electric drive units and, and motors. And within those, there's a number of different, you know, sub components. Um, and it seems the, the, the trend recently is that the electronics are actually getting integrated right into the EDU itself. Um, but with the battery pack side, there's, there's issues with battery pack assembly, uh, battery, sorry, battery tray assembly, battery tray leak testing, the actual battery assembly and electrical testing. And on the electric drive unit, there's new challenges with the assembly and testing there, um, as well as leak testing. And then for, for all the components, you know, washing um, and cleaning off these, these components as part of the manufacturing process is also a critical step. 
So what we're going to focus on a little bit today is specifically on battery tray assembly, battery tray leak testing, but we're going to touch off and off uh, we're going to touch off on all the other aspects of the new new automation requirements. So initially getting into battery tray assembly, um, what we're talking about here um, is the actual battery trays, the actual uh, the actual trays that the battery modules would be installed into. So we're not talking about yet um, actual installing lithium ion cells, but actually building up the basic tray that would house those components. Um, uh, specifically, the, this is going to kind of focus more on the aluminum battery trays and those specific uh, the specific technologies used there, but the same sort of uh, references would be for steel uh, battery trays. So Valiant has already delivered a number of production systems for battery trays. And one of the challenges um, that there is with these battery trays is the actual production volumes. Right now with EVs, we're still in low production volumes overall. So some of the traditional methods of manufacturing don't really make sense. The, the capital cost to put in, you know, fully automated lines that are similar to, you know, typical vehicle systems doesn't, doesn't quite make sense. So what's been developed and what, what seems to work the best right now with the current volumes is actually a cart transfer process. So the lines are set up with all of the technology centers and there's there's various processes that are needed uh, to build up these these battery trays. But the conveyance uh, the conveyance is actually done by a manual push cart. So an operator will move the cart um, from station to station, entering in at the appropriate areas. The part will be processed within that cell. And then the cart is pushed back into the cell, the parts dropped onto it, and then it's moved over to the next next cell. This allows a, a decent amount of flexibility um, and floor space allocation. Um, and it also it also allows uh, different processes to be added in. But obviously, there's some some issues with uh, having people moving, you know, carts around all, all day long. Um, there's only so fast that people can move. They can only deal with so much so much weight, and it, it's difficult to to scale up from here because you can't just add more more people. Um, but there are solutions to that when we start talking about scalability. <clears throat> and this really is one of the big focusing challenges um, with the EV market right now. There's definitely a need for automation. But when we look at the industry trends, we all know that it's going to be increasing, um, the, the actual production volumes that is. But when we actually look at where we are right now, EVs still make up a very small percentage of the, the markets. So what Valiant is focusing on is technologies that can be utilized today with the current production volumes, but easily be ramped up into the future as those production volumes go up. So customers don't need to completely um, repurchase all their capital investment from the lower production volumes. One of the best ways to achieve that is by using AGVs. So the, the systems that, that have been developed and delivered um, are already perfectly set up to move to an AGV based transfer system. The AGVs can directly chain, uh, can directly um, interface where the carts used to interface, moving the parts from cell to cell. And with the AGV systems and fleet management, it provides a different level of quality control because now you can ensure that somebody doesn't accidentally bypass any sort of station. As well, the AGVs can continue to run constantly. Um, so you can increase your overall production without with a, a moderate cap additional capital investment for the AGVs. Um, as well, if this production volumes do meet do make sense for the AGVs right off the bat. There's systems such as the one being shown right now um, for for mega layouts that can provide that can provide those higher production volumes. But there's also another way, and this is one of the things we just I just want to focus on for a little bit. So and it, it the, the topic is matrix manufacturing. But first we gotta you know just redefine what traditional sequential manufacturing is. And these are the assembly lines that we're all typically aware of. Um, they're, they're processes that, you know, go in a linear line from start to finish, you know, they have op 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, however many operations and technologies are required. <clears throat> These are fantastic systems for very high volume, consistent production. If you can keep the lines running and you can keep all the machines going with the production volumes, these make a lot of sense. But some of the issues with this, again, is scalability. If you want to increase your production numbers from this point, 
you're typically going to need to parallel some cells or add a second line. If you want to do some retools, it typically means a considerable amount of downtime. And if you want to add new technologies um, into the line, it's nearly impossible to break the line apart and you know move the machines over so you can squeeze a new cell in between. Typically, typically not possible. But if we consider a different way of doing it, and for, for illustrative pur purposes, we're going to you know, view this uh, shop floor arrangement as a number of boxes. Um, but instead of setting all the technology centers in a linear line, the idea with matrix manufacturing is to group them into technology centers. So these are pre-designed robotic cells um, with a number of robots as needed. Um, without specific end of arm tool and tooling already pre-designed. So the cells are designed, they're ready to deploy, and the only thing that would need to be worked out is the specific uh, end of arm tool and interface tooling needed for each one of those cells. And the way they're designed is everything would have tool changing with automatic tool changers and the AGV systems that would be typically tending the parts from cell to cell would actually be involved in the tool changers. So no longer do you need, to need the tool changers within the actual cell. The robots can drop the tools off on the AGVs. The AGVs can bring them back to you know, a fleet management area. And as needed, they can actually exchange on the fly these different, these different toolings, and then you can effectively automatically switch over your part types. Um, it's completely designed for automated AGVs. Um, the AGVs would actually exist within uh, dedicated areas without humans to allow higher speed motion. Um, and there's options for even subfloors for, for very high volume. Um, but one of, the, one of the concepts here is the AGV path through the system is, is, is dynamic. It's not a fixed path. Um, we know with AGVs um, that, they, that they're great at finding their own path through, through different systems, but with an overall fleet management, you can really have a system where the AGV takes the most efficient path through the system as needed. Um, when you have situations where there's a certain part type or a part variant that doesn't need one of the particular technology centers, instead of you know, having to go through that cell and taking out a little bit of cycle time or capacity, it can just avoid that cell and go to a different, a different area completely. It also has options with multiple technology centers where if you have a, a part that wants to flow through the, the system in a certain way, and while it's happening, a cell is faulted and goes down, the system can dynamically change its route, go over to a different cell of the same technology, and then still exit the cell. Obviously, there can be cycle time impacts there, but overall, your production, you can still maintain some level of production automatically. But where the big benefit with matrix manufacturing come, comes in is the overall scalability. So what can happen is, you know, when, you, when there's a certain component or a certain part type that needs to be developed, um, the initial capital investment can be just for the, the strict number of cells that would be able to you know, meet that meet that production requirement. But then as, as more part families and more different part types are added, the cells can just be duplicated and added on um, to add out overall capacity. And then with a fully distributed system of multiple technology centers with AGV delivered tool changing, you can create situations where a certain number of cells are producing one part type, a whole other different number of cells are producing a different part type, and then another cell is producing you know, even more part types or maybe even some service parts. Because what we're seeing right now with EVs is low production numbers overall when compared to traditional automotive. And we're seeing the vehicle manufacturers being very, um, uh, how to kind of put it, they're, you know, they're, they're not, they're not committing to the production volumes that they're that they're asking. They're not, you know, saying that they're definitely going to give you fifty thousand or seventy thousand parts per year. They'll give estimates of that at best. So, with a fully realized system, um, a moderate capital investment can be used to dynamically change the the production numbers. So, as the production numbers and the production requirements of the different part types go up and down as uh, as the year progresses, the system can dynamically scale to meet the the needs of of the immediate. One of the other significant challenges with the battery trays is actually leak testing of the, the battery trays. 
And I'm, I'm not going to go into too much of the details here. We could have a very long discussion on leak testing. And if anybody's interested, please contact me after and we, we, we can. But leak testing is used to, to validate that there's no leak paths within the actual part. It's, to, it's traditionally been used on automotive components, engine blocks, and cylinder heads to validate the casting integrities. Um, but it's also used on battery trays to, to ensure that there's no leak paths for water or environmental contaminants to get into the batteries and damage any of the lithium ion cells and potentially cause some, you know, some sort of fire. But one of the issues with the battery trays, in, in contrast to the traditional automotive components, is they have very large volumes, they have very thin walls, and what this ends up when, what, what this ends up combining together to mean is the environmental factors that, um, that are existing around the cell that's doing the leak testing can greatly change the actual um, test. Um, one example is the test pressures are very low. Um, you know, a half PSI, 3.5 kPa. Um, typical atmos atmospheric pressure is 101.3 kPa. And I was just checking, and two days ago in Windsor, you know, during the day, the barometric pressure changed by 2 kPa. So, if, you know, the test pressures are 3.5. You can get variation within a day of, of nearly all of that. Um, setting up the, these cells to be able to reference um, different pressures so you can validate leak rates is, is quite complicated. Um, so methods are being developed and are, are <clears throat> methods are being developed to work on that. But you know, quickly talking about the different types of leak testing methods. Um, you know, the typical pressure decay um, is just you know you add air of a known pressure to a volume, you lock that air in there, and you monitor the pressure over time. And basically, as you're measuring the pressure drop over a known period of time, you can equate that to some sort of leak rate. Pressure decay works fine for sub-assemblies, coolant passages, small volumes. When we talk about the main cavities, um, it doesn't, it's not effective because there's too much noise in the system. Those environmental factors end up muddying up the, uh, the measurements. So the next methods are differential pressure decay and mass flow. Um, I kind of group them together even though they're, they're different systems, but what they do is they attempt to isolate the system from more of the environmental factors. Mass airflow does it by having a reference volume where the test item pulls, pulls air from if it is leaking, and differential pressure decay is similar, but it compares two exact test volumes, one of a known zero leak and one of an unknown leak to see what, how, they, how they change over time. The benefit there is both of the test articles are going under the same environmental changes. So if there is temperature changes or any sort of pressure changes, they're both experiencing it in the same way, thus you can cut out some of the noise. But the method that's, that's becoming most prevalent right now is using tracer gas. So tracer gas was used for a number of years um, to help detect leaks on production leak test systems, but it's been developed into systems that can actually be used to measure leaks. And what tracer gas systems are, <clears throat> it's a system where you, you 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 add a known tracer gas of a certain percentage, it can be hydrogen, helium, or some sort of organic tracer gas into one side, either the part side or the cavity side. Um, but what happens is the, the battery would be, the battery tray would be loaded into a cell, um, an enclosure is dropped down around it to isolate it. Um, but as I mentioned, the, um, the tracer gas is injected into one of the two sides, depending if you wanna do pressure testing or vacuum testing. And there's a sensor that's installed on the opposite side. And by, by having a little bit of differential pressure, you can force the tracer gas to find the holes and flow through into the, the areas where it would be leaking. And what we would actually measure is the rate of change of the parts per million that the sensor is measuring. And we can relate that back to a known leak rate by using some calibration routines with some, uh, some known orifices. So some certified orifices can be installed of known leak rates. We can measure what the parts per million rate rise would be based on a known leak, and then we can make some uh, correlation. It's a good system because it um, removes any of the issues affected by volume, temperature, and the environmental changes, but there are some risks. Um, when you're dealing with aluminum battery trays that have aluminum extrusion sections, which do have hollow sections, in the event that you did have a leak that goes through one of those sections, it's possible that the tracer gas might not make it all the way through into the main cavity within the actual, within the actual test time. 
So because of that, the differential pressure and mass airflow methods are still being still being researched and developed right now. And Valiant is working on some research projects for those to eliminate the, some of those the, the potential failure mode of the uh, of the tracer gas system. So moving on to battery electrical testing, and I'm going to end up, I, for the in the sake of time, I'm probably not going to get too in depth on any of the the next few topics. But um, battery battery electrical testing. Um, so just so everyone you know, kind of on the same page with the terminology, when you talk about you know different battery cells, modules, packs, the battery cells are the you know the small lithium ion cells that are manufactured typically by LG or Samsung or any of the other uh, battery manufacturers. But then the vehicle OEMs take those, they arrange them in certain configurations into different modules, and then multiples of those modules are grouped together to actually create the uh, the battery pack. So Valiance developed solutions for electrical testing. Uh, shown here is a module test stand. Obviously, the test article is blurred out because all of this is still very proprietary for our customers. But uh, the systems are set up. It's set up to be able to do high pot and grounding testing to validate the integrity of all the um, of all the the internal spot welds. Um, bank to bank resistance testing, charging, discharging, voltage, and current. There's a number of different things that can be measured. And these cells are, are set up in a way that they can easily be converted over to AGV systems. Currently, they're cart-based systems, like we talked about for the battery trays. Um, but very simply, they can be moved to, to AGVs for scalability as well. Um, and then there's battery pack electrical testing as well. It's the same thing as battery module, but the, this is now the fully assembled battery pack. Um, again, a cart process currently, but as production numbers increase, AGV or conveyor systems um, will be brought in. For the actual electric drive units, so this is the actual housings for the electric motors that actually propel the vehicle. Um, a lot of these components are actually being manufactured similar to typical transmission components. So for cases and houses, housings, um, they're being done in typical CNC machining lines. There are requirements to wash those parts, and Valiant, you know, is, is uh, has our standard Valley Flex robotic flexible washers available um, to meet all those standards. And we've deployed a number of units for the EDU components. Um, there's also leak test systems for EDU components, following along from some of the traditional uh, transmission leak testers. Valiant, Valiant TMS has developed uh, pneumatically powered leak test systems without hydraulics and with full automatic leak test tool changing. So that gives the ability to run multiple completely different um, part types within one leak test system. Again, um, adding that scalability. So the investment on technology maybe for you know, one part that doesn't have a particularly high volume can be, um, can be offset by being able to run multiple parts within the same leak test machine. Um, and then after final assembly with the ele electric drive units, there's actually end of, line en end of line test cells. So these are effectively dynamometers that validate all the performance characteristics of the electric drive units. Um, de de deployed systems that Valiant TMS has done are 600 volts, 800 amp DC battery simulation systems, but there is capability up to 1200 volts, 1500 amps. 1,000 kilowatt, 10,000 newton meter of torque, torque absorption capacity uses a regenerative system to, to recoup some of the electricity that is being absorbed. But basically what these, these cells are doing is validating the NVH, um, all the pressures, temperatures, speeds, and all the, all the uh, output back to the ECU. These include full data acquisition, logging, diagnostics, uh, everything that the test, engin test engineers would need to actually validate the full assembly of their, their products. Okay, and Chris, also, we're, getting, yep. we're getting close to the end of our time here. You yep. got a and few I just, more slides? I just got two more and I was gonna fly through them pretty quick because I was pretty sure I was getting to the end. So so also <laughs> on, the, on the same slide of the, the EDU, we also have solutions for electric motor testing. So these are the actual motors that'll actually go in the electric drive units. And these can be palletized or conveyor-based systems doing rotor and stator hot and cold testing, checking voltages, resistances, and then the same thing on the rotor side. Uh, testing balance, testing uh, back EMF and different voltage and uh, voltage and current current things. And that's it. Well, thank you again, Chris. That was a really informative presentation. If you want to stop sharing your screen. Yeah.
that'd be great. So just a reminder to any of our attendees, if you have questions about Chris's presentation or for Chris in general about Valiant, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat area where I can pick them up later when we engage in some discussion. So Chris, again, thank you so much for sharing the information. It seems like there's a lot going on with electrical vehicles and um, battery manufacturing over there at Valiant. And I'm sure those great pictures of what's happening inside your building are really, uh, they speak a thousand words, if you will. So I'm sure people will have some questions for you later, including me. So I'm going to have you uh, exit the platform right now. And I'm going to bring Allie on, or excuse me, Alan on. And there is Alan. Good morning, Alan. I'm going to let you take it away from here. So if you want to share your screen and we can get started. All right. Well, hi, I'm Alan, and I'd like to say thanks to our, our moderator, Janine, and thanks to the conference for asking me to speak. So a little bit more about me. Uh, I've been in technology for over 20 years with the last 17 of that in the manufacturing space. Uh, I love solving problems, designing solutions, innovating, and in general, being creative. And yes, as Janine said, uh, I see new technologies as Lego bricks that can that I can use to build something awesome. So what am I going to talk about? Uh, at last year's conference, I gave a talk about how manufacturing workforces are being transformed due to augmented reality. Basically, it was about why you should use AR, who's already using it, and for what. For this talk, I, I kind of want to pick up where I left off and further explain these solutions the why and a bit of the what. This is a deeper dive into the what. And I actually have a lot of really cool examples to show you. Uh, before I get into my talk, let me give you uh, some quick context uh, to Data Realm. We're not off the shelf product developers. Uh, we're not here to compete with the Microsofts of the world. You may have seen uh, their really cool presentation this morning and said, that's awesome, or asked, uh, how do I incorporate new technology into my existing process? That's where we come in. We're systems integrators. We deploy solutions, connect existing solutions, upgrade solutions, and build bespoke solutions that fit the needs of our customers. We have decades of experience in FIS, MES, and controls. Um, and the best part is, is that we're not tied to any platform or technology. So when new tech, new emerging tech like AR starts hitting the scene, we're in the right spot to see how and where it can solve problems. So to start, I, I wanna quickly set the stage for AR. These are some common infographics out there showing Industry 4.0. Augment, augmented reality is part of Industry 4.0, which is a system of connected technologies that leverage the best of all of them. These are being used to digitally transform manufacturing. So why AR? Well, because AR can extend the capabilities of existing solutions, enable entirely new game-changing solutions, and oh yeah, leverage those other Industry 4.0 technologies. AR brings value through increasing efficiency, reducing risk, and by facilitating business intelligence. So with it, you can increase efficiency by reducing the skills gap, by improving worker output through decreased times to do tasks, uh, effectively uh, enabling effective collaboration and with visual interfaces. AR reduces risk through preventative maintenance, reducing downtime through instructions and support and enabling worker safety. And AR can also facilitate business intelligence with on the spot data visualization, enabling more data collection and allowing you to apply powerful artificial intelligence. The biggest use cases that I've seen leverage one or more of these core ROIs. So, I'd like to take a sec to uh, remind everybody uh, that my previous talk was a deep dive into why you should use AR, who's using it, and for what. It outlined many of these use cases and the problems that they solved and compiled a lot of real world examples. Um, these are just some of the links to it. And I know Janine threw uh, a link in the chat at the, at the beginning of the, uh, um, the breakout session. Uh, I highly recommend you check it out when you can. Um, it'll answer your questions more so of the why. So, oh, side note, 
these were um, many of the companies that we investigated for that uh, previous talk that were already using or piloting AR. It's only expanded since then. Side note two, I uh, also had mentioned in my last talk about Mercedes-Benz uh, deploying AR to their dealerships. And as Microsoft noted uh, earlier today, and as Mercedes announced in a, in a press release last week, uh, that's exactly what they're doing. So I gave you a little bit about why you should use it, um, but what is AR? Augmented reality allows the viewer to see the real world with digital data displayed over it. Sometimes is a 2D heads-up display and sometimes has 3D, 3D holograms. Some systems also track the device and the user to enable interaction with digital elements, things like voice commands, pushing buttons, or even manipulating holograms. Let me quickly specify what I mean by augmented reality or AR for the scope of this presentation. Um, AR is part of a spectrum of digital visualization technologies, often called extended reality or XR. At one end, you have virtual reality with full digital immersion. And at the other end, you have augmented reality where you see and interact with the real world. And in the middle is mixed reality. For many of the industry problems I'm gonna go, I'm gonna cover, uh, there could be multiple solutions that span the range of AR to MR. But for simplicity, I'm just gonna call them all AR and stay away from the technical details. So. Inside of the AR space, there's a range of experiences and technologies. And as far as devices, there's a lot of options out there and one's still on their way from some big names. Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft all have new hardware in the works. Okay, so let's get back to the use cases. When I talk about these, because they're so new, I find people have difficulties picturing the benefits of AR and not being able to picture it is a barrier for understanding the possibilities, or maybe it's just that I'm a visual learner. But to address this, my team and I have started building examples to illustrate the possibilities. So let's dive in. For construction and training, these solutions tend to cover a spectrum from training where you have full knowledge transfer upfront to work instructions where the instructions are always available to assist the worker to finally workflow management, where the solution is directed, uh, is directing the worker on what to do and is always on. What they all have in common is that they aid workers in understanding how to do the job. This is an example. Well, in this example, we're using an applica our application to demo instructions for assembling a small engine, specifically putting on an air filter. Using augmented reality for work and instruction and training allows the users to complete tasks more efficiently by not having to go back and forth like they would uh, with traditional material. They reduce the risk of uh, un unavailable expertise by allowing them and allow you to drop the skill set and potentially automate your workforce. On that topic, we currently have an ongoing pilot with Ford testing AR training of assembly workers. While I can't show you any videos from our partner's facility, I can talk about some of our milestones. We aim for assembly, engine assembly, it can be superimposed over real assembly stations. Our system was able to train employees on how to do assembly jobs they didn't previously know. We showed it was possible to do training on the line during live production. However, we got better results from a mix of offline and inline training. Uh, we were also able to reduce or eliminate the time another employee would have spent training these workers for their new job. This is an example of mobile AR. Uh, instructions in AR for that matter are not confined to headsets, you, as you can see here. Um, since no one ever knows how to use our, our Office Espresso machine, one of our developers took uh, our work instructions app and switched up some of the components and used it to make uh, Espresso instructions. The same could be done for a lot of the examples that I'm gonna show you, where you can put them into um, a mobile application or uh, other medium. Uh, remember, there's a spectrum of, of picking which one really depends on what benefits, uh, what's the best fit for solving the problem. So, data visualization. 
is where you can see meaningful data superimposed over the real world. Uh, for example, real-time SCADA data, um, IoT sensor data, vision data, virtual HMIs, or business intelligence data over the real world. Part of digital twinning is making a virtual twin of real world objects or the other way around and using AR to plan the real world. For instance, in the picture above, the user is placing a 3D model uh, for planning the location of future machinery. This is an example of one of our, uh, this example is one of the systems I'm most excited about. Here we've taken a mini conveyor line we made for automation demos and removed the HMI that was used to interface with the PLC. The holographic system has replaced the HMI. This shows real-time data pulled from a plant floor device and then displayed over the corresponding data sources for context. And we can do the same thing with MES data. You can see uh, two-way communication with the PLC in the form of that uh, push release button. And uh, if you watch the pallets as they move around the line, the states of the stations are changing and being displayed. There we go. AR allows you, allows you to display data more efficiently and design display methods that meet workers' needs. For example, our, this example shows four display methods that are more efficient than using a TV, laptop, or HMI to receive work data. A worker loses time going back and forth from focusing on a fixed screen like a TV and then reorienting to their work location and then looking back to the screen for the next piece of information. Here, the data can be displayed in a heads-up display, always visible, or in that palm display that the worker controls or in, in a virtual display board that can be moved around um, with the worker or by the worker and is invisible inside other objects. And oh yeah, there's those look here globes on the bumper. Speaking of look here globes, um, those are great on stationary objects, but in this example, we investigated synchronizing holograms with a continuously moving line. The randomly generated red dots represent defect data sent from an external vision system. Uh, when a worker has to move along with the vehicle body, time, the time loss of finding info from a wall-mounted TV is increased. And here we're hoping to address that. While data visualization was about showing and understanding data, virtual 3D interfaces are about user control and input. The easiest way to explain is that these are like the holographic interfaces that you see in movies and media. You can build any input console you'd like with what you need, where you need it, when you need it, and customizable to users and workflows. I already showed you the conveyor video, but this is a great real world, real world example of a virtual interface. As said, uh, we completely replaced the HMI with a holographic system. Uh, in many manufacturing cells I've seen, the existing HMI is not even close to the action. This is an example of using palm menus to move uh, as we're talking about uh, 3D interfaces. And it also shows uh, some hologram manipulation, which is pretty cool. This one shows some more controls and it's just cool. Of course, um, here, um, my teammates using a ray to move that uh, bar. You could also use your fingers to pinch it and move it with your hand. So let's talk about worker safety. AR can reduce uh, risk for workers by providing a heads up uh, uh, display and hands-free interface. It can facilitate COVID procedures by limiting what users touch and by enab enabling collaboration at a distance or even remotely. AR can also give contextual routing like logistics directions or emergency exits. In this example, warnings, reminders, and safety instructions can be played to help users. HUD-like messages can force critical information in front of the viewer. Here, is requires user confirmation of PPE and can save a record of that for a safety audit later. Danger zones can be set up and alarms like fire alarms and emergency routes can be displayed.
Remote collaboration is another big use. Uh, if you have a worker that runs into a problem um, that they don't have the skills to resolve, they can start a video call with an expert uh, to work through the issue. This is a quick example of calling an expert. Just being able to stream video and an audio tune from your device opens up a lot of possibilities. Side note, we're currently looking at this uh, or looking into this for adding media capture to medical traceability systems. Yeah. That segues into data collection. I think people tend to forget that AR and MR devices are, are as much inputs as they are visual outputs with the capabilities to track hand interactions, user location, identity, record sounds and record videos. Just like how you can use uh, a virtual control panel, you can have a, a virtual data entry point. You can create interfaces to collect the data anywhere without having to have a laptop or plant floor HMI. Even more powerfully, you can auto automatically collect data from users as they process through their workflow. Um, this was viewable in the example we showed earlier of the car bumper. As the user interacted with the holograms, the system automatically kept track of which tasks they had completed. So this is a really cool example where we took a real life robot and made a digital twin of it. Uh, you can use your hands to control the, the twin, giving it instructions. And here, we're using our lens to create a 3D spatial map of the environment, passing it to an AI that can determine uh, where the walls are and then passing that to another AI that can determine the paths for the robot twin to avoid obstacles. So that was a simple example. This is a way cooler example where we made a small maze. The next steps for this would be investigating ways to transfer these instructions back to a real robot in control of that. So. Alan, um, I'm just jumping in to let you know we only have a few minutes left. Well, I, I guess it's perfect that I'm, that I'm almost done. So um, AR is a jump in technological capabilities and efficiencies. Um, same way the, the PC, laptop, tablet and recently smartphone all, are all jumps. Um, at first, people can imagine these devices as part of their jobs and, and now they can't live without them. I know when I got my first smartphone, I didn't think, hey, this thing's gonna become the camera that I use every day. AR is like that. So I remain excited for the still unthought of use cases and using it as part of bigger solutions and to see what comes next. So thanks. Wonderful information. I'm just bringing Chris back on board here, and I want to thank you both for your uh, presentations today and a view of what's new and exciting happening in automotive manufacturing. We didn't get any questions from the group, but I just have a couple of comments. So, Alan, I love that um, Tony Stark works with you guys. I saw that in your presentation. It looks like he's very comfortable there in your office at Data Realm. And Chris, you know, lots of activities going on. So it seems that Valiant has really explored and been successful in garnering a lot of work in the electric uh, vehicle, uh, particularly in the battery manufacturing. Um, yep. You know, in thinking about battery manufacturing too for Valiant, is there uh, more opportunities for automation? And are you always thinking as a team about how to continue to um, innovate your production systems to keep in line with what's happening with Industry 4.0? Yeah, that that's the, exactly. It, it, the, the new EV products, they're they're challenging and kind of for the reasons that I outlined with the with the volumes re required, you know, we're, we're used to building, you know, typical systems that are doing 800,000 parts per day or, or more. Yeah. And how do you do something where they need they need 10 a day? Well, how do, how do you how do you produce that sort of thing? You have to scale it down because these multi million dollar systems don't don't make sense. So constantly looking at the parts and seeing where the technology is going. 
what new technologies can be applied um, is, is always at the forefront. And yes, EV is a, is a, is a strategic move for, for Valiant TMS and getting into that marketplace. There's a lot of great opportunities uh, for automation and, and stuff into the future. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. And Alan, I, you know, I can see tons of applications coming from manufacturing myself and primarily automotive manufacturing. I'm thinking about the interfaces of having people doing training and learning on the job. If, you know, they can see right away using some of the technology that you showcased where potential hazards exist or where things have not been installed properly or, you know, a quick update on a work instruction for a quality issue that occurred, you know, after the fact as a reminder, gosh, I can think of a million other applications. Uh, we're going to leave the session today. But again, thank you both for participating in the conference. And on behalf of the conference organizing team, um, we really uh, look forward to these presentations every year so that we can see what's happening. Enjoy the rest of your day. And for the audience that's still out there, please feel free to join back on the main stage. Thank you. Thank you.